Hello, everyone. Another episode of the Bill Chun Show. We are less than two weeks from one of the biggest elections in our modern time. All I'm going to ask you to do is vote, especially if you happen to be someone like me, a naturalized citizen, meaning came to this country legally and after five years, you undergo testing and become a citizen. It is your right. I've already voted. And I'm hoping that many of my fellow immigrants will do the same. Of all the elections, this is the one. I won't tell you who to vote for, but please vote. I want to tell you about a recent delivery I had. Having done this for 30 some years now, I must say thousands of babies I've delivered, I don't I cannot remember all of them, but a few certainly have left a huge impression on me. Now, this lovely couple had a fetal demise or stillbirth at 8 months last year. I know miscarriages, which are very common, very hurtful, very hard to get over, and many of the miscarriages are in the first trimester, when you're seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 in weeks. But to lose a pregnancy at eight months, that's very difficult. The person still has to go through the process of giving birth, and that process had to be induced so you are in the same labor and delivery unit as other mothers who will be joyous with what's supposed to be the most amazing life event. This particular couple, amazing couple, they endured their hardship and grieved, healed, still healing, I'm sure, and after a while, just this week, they welcomed a beautiful, healthy girl. And to play a small role in that process, that's what makes me tick. It's amazing. I mean, every birth, but this particular one. So the day went like this. A week before her due date, we had a plan to induce her labor. Induction of labor is a very artificial process that even in 2020, we are not very good at. She was brought in, and then I placed a chemical agent called Cervidil in the vagina, which is, help, which is supposed to make the cervix to be softer, thinner, open up. And by itself, it can cause labor to kick in. But about 16 hours is what it took for this beautiful girl to be born. And the whole day, it was almost like watching the patient, you know, she was, she was almost like possessed in a positive way. Just, just labored along Never a complaint. And when she delivered the baby, I really, I, I remember asking one of my nurses, hey, she doesn't have an epidural, does she? Because I knew she didn't, but the patient, she somehow separated any pain, any discomfort from the process of giving birth. And to watch her face as I handed this beautiful newborn and to watch her partner, her husband, embrace that moment. I think that's the moment that for someone like me, who is not religious, but I have to believe there is higher power. I can't imagine not. You know, I see these patients for nine months, 
from the time they miss their period, from the time the very first test, urine test, blood test, seven, eight weeks, early ultrasound, and for nine months, I see them, and I, I see the change, not only their physical state, but mental state. And I've done this with so many pregnant patients, and this one, this week, I felt honored to witness such process. And, you know, I, like I said, th this is where someone like me would say, wow, divine intervention. This is a good segue for me to introduce my next topic. Before my guest comes on later, I wanted to um, talk about a person. I was thinking for the past half century I have lived in this country. What well-known immigrant could I talk about so that I can educate you? Really, who could I talk about and say, here is a person who really took advantage of this country? And of course, it had to be Korean. And no, it's not BTS band. It certainly isn't. I almost went with Bruce Lee, but no. I've decided to talk a bit about Reverend Moon. There he is, Reverend Moon. And I wanted to share a little bit about his story because, boy, did he have a vision. I'm not at all saying I agree with many of his visions or his main visions that he's Messiah, that he is second Adam, and that he and his wife, whom people called true parents, who, um, you know, way they use the religion was to really deal with this mass weddings. Look at that. That one, I think, was in Madison Square Garden. 2,000 couples. But you know, what this man believed in was crossing nationalities, races. He wanted everyone to marry. Didn't matter what race, what country. Because he believed that unification was the quickest way to world peace. Right or wrong, that took a vision. And you know, here is what's amazing. Get ready for this. He only preached in Korean. Can you believe that? So here's a man who comes to the United States in 1971, just shortly before I came to the United States. For the next 50 years, he created this dynasty, if you will, affecting millions and millions of people only in Korean. It's like, imagine if I said, 여러분, 안녕하십니까? 제 이름은 전병렬입니다. 오늘 저를 보아주셔서 대단히 감사합니다. Did you hear what I said? Can you? That's what he did. He spoke only in Korean. And I'm saying, okay, he claimed to be Messiah, second Adam, from Korea, okay? And not only, it wasn't like he had a little church in middle of nowhere in Ohio. I learned that his church, his organization, is considered the largest or they own more sushi restaurants than anyone else in this country. Can you believe that? They're number two exporters from South Korea. They own the most successful soccer club in South Korea. They own the only automobile manufacturing company in North Korea, multiple multimedia entities, including Washington Times. They have this ballet academy called Kirov in Washington, D.C., which is internationally known. And I'm saying, wow, how did he do that? And he came here only in 71. 
Reverend Moon was born in North Korea in 1920. So to give you a little historical lesson, 1920, Korea was under control of Japan. Korea being a little peninsula between China to the north and Japan to the south, it got invaded from the south by Japan, by China from the north, back and forth, back and forth throughout our history. But from late 1800s until the end of Second World War II, summer of 1945, Korea was controlled by Japan. So Reverend Moon was born in North Korea, and then after World War II ended, he was imprisoned by North Koreans because they thought he was a spy to South Korea. He was anti-communist. And in 54, he started his first church, Unification Church, in Korea. And then he started this trend of blessing ceremonies or mass weddings. The year I was born, in 1961, his very first one, he had 80 couples in Korea. And then he comes to the United States in 1971, and he got involved with politics. So when President Nixon was in trouble because of Watergate, Reverend Moon and his followers had this demonstration in Washington, and that gave him some media exposure, and President Nixon thanked him in person. Then there you go. Next thing you know, there's elder President Bush, younger President Bush, Mikhail Gorbachev, president of Russia, well-known Islam leader Farrakhan, they all became part of his, I don't want to say network, but his friends. By 1992, he had this mass ceremony in Madison Square Garden where he married 2,000 couples. And if you do Google search, you look at these people, these are, you know, different race, men and women. And by... 2012, that number went to 30,000 couples in South Korea. Now, why am I mentioning Reverend Moon? First of all, I've always had this fascination with Reverend Moon. I always thought, wow, holy shit. You know, imagine me trying to practice medicine in Korea and I'll have no practice, right? But here is Reverend Moon who spoke only in Korean. And he had all these followers from around the world following his unification church. No, not everyone agreed with his beliefs. But he must have convinced enough because look at his empire. From sushi restaurants to manufacturing cars to multimedia, they own them all. So the influence Reverend Moon had in our culture is widely extended. For all you know, you ate at one of his sushi restaurants. And you would have never known that the whole thing was started by North Korean minister named Moon who spent 50 years of his life in this country trying to do service. And, and I thought, wow, of all the people I could think of, I had to mention Reverend Moon. Since I had talked about divine intervention with one of my patients who delivered this week, I thought there was the right person to talk about. But check it out, Reverend Moon on Google. Is everywhere. Now, I'm going to introduce my guest for tonight, who I hope I am pronouncing his name correctly, Dmitry Pedagudov, amazing business entrepreneur from Russia. And I'm going to get him on Skype, and I have lots of questions for him, so I hope he's ready. 
he started this um, internet company that's very interesting. As an engineer, he came to the United, United States at the age of 23 in 1996. And before long, he started this very successful internet company. So let me see if I can get him on the phone. Hello? How are you? Hey, how are you? Good. Dimitri. May I call Hi. you Dimitri? You? Pleasure to meet you. Same here. Thanks for your time. Wow. What, what an interesting story you have. I read through all the um, sites you guided me to, and I was fascinated by your story. So what I got was you were 23 when you came to this country, having received education in engineering back home, and you came here in 96? 1997, yeah. 1997. Yeah. And then you continued work. Um, looks like you got into a software high-tech company working as a software engineer and then program developer. That's right. Now, let's start with your Russian history. How your entire family came to the United States? Yeah. Um, so my, my mom is still in, in Moscow, Russia. Uh, uh -huh. And my, my dad, he, he uh, you know, they were divorced uh, when I when I was uh, five. So, so I kind of have sort of two families. So my father's uh, family and my mother's. And uh, so so my, my dad, he came to the U.S. when I was like 13 14 or so and mm -hmm. uh with his you know his other wife and uh his my brother uh my half brother yeah and so they they came uh around 19 1990 1999 or so and then uh as refugees uh from from russia and then so they, they lived here since uh, and i and i joined my dad in 1997. so now, for the way I got to, came to the United States was uh, my father was sponsored by her by his parents, uh, who was sponsored by one of their kids who married American. But you had mentioned your you know that's the that's what happened to many of us. But with your father, he was declared as a refugee from Russia. Yes, yeah, so like we are, we are you know Russian Jews. Uh, so uh, you know in Russia there was. Uh, Quite a bit of anti-Semitism at sure. the time when my father was living there, so he had a lot of cases where he was uh, unfairly treated as a, as a Jew. Um, so, like, declined you know proper work options and you know uh, university and so on. So, so he was able to sort of get out of Russia and you know come to the U.S. on the premise of uh, there's a there's a louder back louder back low um, sort of a is this Jewish thing where they allow Jews who were prosecuted or somehow unfairly treated in their home country to come and seek uh, refugee status in, in the U.S. And so he was granted, his family was granted that. He came as a refugee here. And then um, when I came, um, this law was still applicable. And since he was here, it was much easier for me to sort of join. Sure. But I still, came, I still came as a refugee myself uh, on the same premise. And uh, so, yeah, um, that worked out. So you received your college education here? Well, actually, partially, I uh, my bachelor's from uh, from Moscow, Russia, in uh, architectural engineering and computer engineering, and then I came here. Um, I I got my uh, my master's here, and um, I got an MBA here. So yeah. Okay. So when your father came here first, what was his life like? Was the was he able to continue his profession that he had in in Russia or did he have to change? Yeah, as a matter of fact, he he um, he was able to uh, get a good job. Uh, he, his first job was in Kentucky in University uh, University of Kentucky in Louisville. Uh, so he was uh, he was like a database admin there. So he he, he was computer science uh, uh, specialist, uh, you know, software engineer back in Russia in Moscow. So when he came uh, to the U.S., he get his first job was. Uh, also, you know, in database administration and, and, and software. And so, like, later he moved to Maine, and, and in the state of Maine, he also had a job in Hannaford as database administrator as well. So his whole career was basically in IT and, and software development. So he was, you know, basically in his, in his field, yeah. Yeah. And then when you came here, 
Uh, how, what did you do? Did you just go straight to getting your MBA or? No, it's, it wasn't like this. I mean, I came, I was, I was a kid, I was 22, right? Yeah. So like, you don't know exactly what you want when you're 22. Well, at least I didn't. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I was like, I remember vividly driving from airport when my, uh, my dad was, you know, showing me subway on the corner and saying, look, this, this subway is a, is a startup once. And the guy, you know, came up with a software idea. You know, if you if you like, you could become you know entrepreneur here and start your own business like this guy from Subway and look look at him he has Subway in every corner in the U.S. So you know so I got pretty inspired him saying that and uh, that was kind of my uh, early early on when I set my foot in the U.S. I felt like that was going to be something I wanted to do uh, start a business. So is it when you started your first company, Russia Flora? Yeah, so like I. It, it wasn't immediate, like, so it, it took a while as, uh, uh, you know, I, I came, I was 22, my, my company, the first company I started was around, I was around 27. Uh, by then I already, you know, acquired some skills to actually do it because in the beginning I had the desire, but I don't think I've had skills and my English wasn't so great. So like to start the business in the U S at least, you know, you need to speak English to some degree. <laughs> so I felt like I wasn't ready at the time and I, I had a strong desire, but I didn't have the skill. So it took me like five years to actually get get to the point where I was comfortable to do it. So, and that led to the next venture and then to your current venture by 2007, which... Correct. Well, I, I've had some startups on my way uh, when, I, when I did my Bobson MBA here um, in, uh, in Wellesley. I... I met some people, uh, you know, other students, and we've done we've done two startups when I was in in, in school uh, in Boston. There's a very good program where they let you start try a business while you're in school. There's a hatchery where you, they help you out with the office space, printers, phones, and so on. So, like, you know, we, we've tried business with other students, and we we've started another business um, in an online marketing company called mm -hmm. Onsite Videos, and that was that was pretty good uh, for some time. I've learned to take more risks and eventually company went bankrupt, but it took, it took some time to, uh, to learn the business. And, you know, so, so exposure to other kind of businesses was very, very good experience. And also meeting some people who were much more risky than I was, uh, that was also a good experience in, in an MBA program. And eventually, yeah, eventually I did get back into my online e-commerce business that I started earlier and I kept going and growing it. And eventually getting into the point where it is uh, today. Well, I actually, when I was reading it, I actually liked that you, in retrospect, you appreciated the slow, slower growth because of money and whatnot. But you, you know, grew organically, and you didn't have to take as much of a risk, right? Exactly, exactly, Bill. I mean, if you look, if you look at uh, you know success stories we see on online and. On the media, all the all the people like, uh, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg or someone, uh, someone like you know Bill Gates, they 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 tend to have a success story behind them where they took a risk, quit their school, quit their job, you know, did nothing except their startup. And I didn't have that. Like I, I had a very slow, organic growth. And you know, in retrospect, I actually think if I was to do it like they did it. I would have been much further. I mean, I, I would have been probably much bigger, but I think I, I got it very comfortably, right? I did it without taking as much risk as some other entrepreneurs do. And I, I just took my time and I learned and I, I kept my full-time job working part-time in my business. Eventually, it felt like a right time to quit. So I don't think you can do it in every case, but like in my business, I could. And I think it was a it was a comfortable ride compared to some other big folks who are really struggling, go hungry until they reach success. You know. Yeah, and, and also I just by listening to you, is it fair to say when you, your father and you made the transition from Russia to here, it sounds like there were good support through your Russian Jewish community, for jobs and whatnot, or. Well, I'd say so. I mean. Um, to some degree, there, there is some support. Um, there's some people you meet in the community yeah. that can introduce you to certain other people. I haven't had, I haven't had a need, on, you know, of that. Like my father, I think, and my stepmother, they did when they first came to this country. I, I haven't, uh, but I know that 
community can be helpful, Russian yeah. or Jewish or any ethnic community locally. In the state of Maine, where I've started in the U.S., there was not much community, to be honest. I mean, we there was very few Russian people. There was very few immigrants, actually, at all. Yeah. So in Maine, I think it's actually quite a tough place to start, to be honest. I feel, uh, you know, I feel that there, there could be easy for immigrants if, if, if they were in New York or Boston, you know, somewhere like that. Maine is not is not the easiest place to, to be for the immigrant. So once you started in 2007, how long did it take you to break even or get into black? So um, so my first like a hobby business that I started the Russian Florida was 2002, actually. And then five years later, um, like that was with my business partner. We did it together and uh, it was a flower business, mostly romantic gifts. And then 2007, I realized that this model could work for many more things than just flowers. And I and I started a separate business, which was around the corporate gifts and baskets. And that that's really, uh, when I started the second business, uh, sort of a separate from flower one, uh, I already knew how, how it's done and I, and I was much quicker in getting it off the ground. So it took me about, I would say nine months to get to profitability, about less than a year. But the first one took maybe two years to mm -hmm. really get get something out of it. Now you're doing well. Over 200 countries is what I read. Yeah, 200 countries. We uh, we kind of stopped increasing the number of countries. We got we got growing deeper. So in each country, we now try to grow more deeper roots as opposed to growing horizontally. We, mm -hmm. we grow vertically now uh, because beyond these 200 countries, if you try to go for another 40, that's pretty tough because, you know, I think these 200 countries where the most demand is, but if you start looking at other 40, you're going to get into countries like North Korea and Cuba, where you can't do business much as an American company. So, sure. you know, so we don't do that. <laughs> Here's a question I've been dying to ask. Why do Russians excel in math and physics? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's because in Russia, you know, um, at least my experience, in my days, the the basic education, like the the uh, the base the baseline education, was very strong, and the, the baseline education is basically your Russian language skills, literature, and math and physics, right? So those those are really four things, you know, Russian literature, you know, math and physics. So so math being a, a you know like a cornerstone of physics as well, in a way, you can think that way, and basically math needs to be given a very good level. So a lot of people uh, are very strong in math from Russia, and even a really, really basic school in Russia would be generally stronger than pretty tough school in the U.S. I would say, uh, at least in my days, that's how it was. So when I when I came here, you know, I, I'm looking at my and my kids learning math here. I, I feel like they, you know, they have it very easy, and that the education in math, the base, the ba the background. Uh, that you need to, to go to the next level is not really strong. So it's gonna to be tough for them to go to the next level. So that's that's why we give them a lot of extracurricular math. There's a Russian school of mathematics, there's other studio math studios around here in Boston. So we try to give them that opportunity and, and tutor them at home as well. So when I was in Korea, I came here when I was 12, um, there, you know, not junior high school, but certainly college, at every step it was exam school. Is that like that in Russia? Going from junior high to high school to college, competitive? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I would say so. I mean, they try to break people into, into at least two groups and sometimes more. So there's a stronger math group, usually about half, half of the kids go to the stronger side and, and other kids who are not as strong, they go to like not strong side and they mm -hmm. sort of being given, they're giving up on those skills, skills, kids as much. So like those kids who really are stronger, they, they get more attention and they really get tutored a lot stronger. So there's a big separation there. But yeah, you, you'd, I'd say so that amongst those who are stronger, there is, there's going to be some competition. Yeah. Another question I wanted to ask you was, um, I was reading about this, you know, I was listening to your long distance short podcast was very oh. entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, I have patients who are Russians, married to American. So, I mean, are Russian women seeking love interests outside of U.S. because of any particular reason, or what is that? 
I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very complicated topic, probably deserving uh, its own <laughs> its own time. But but giving giving you a short answer, my opinion, just in my humble opinion, I mean, one thing is economical, right? So like, you mm -hmm. know, from from late 90s, when the borders started opening, uh, the, the life in Russia was pretty tough. And financially, um, it was difficult, uh, especially for women uh, to get a good job, to to have a good life. And so uh, Internet offered an opportunity, a window to meet foreigners uh, and those women who were able to converse in English or somehow uh, technical enough to go online. They, they took opportunity and there were a lot of dating sites created around this process and they were photographed and they, the bios were put in there. Mm. So a lot of that started happening. So the first thing is economical. And uh, second, one I think, is social economical and social part of it is um, I wouldn't say Moscow is an example of that. Moscow is like in New York is a very different place from any other place in the country, right? So Moscow, I would say, separate. But everywhere else in Russia, and I would say former Soviet Union, there's a big demographic disparity where there's a lot more women on the market to get married. I would say market is being available mm -hmm. to get married. Healthy women who are looking for good husband, as opposed to husbands that are available, who are healthy, and make a good husband. So th that creates a situation where some cities like Ivanova, this is like one example, 75% women, 25% men, I'm talking mm -hmm. about an age group where they would get married and have kids, and who are healthy and representing certain populations. So in general, in Russia, that's, that's a situation that demographically skewed towards women looking for a proper family and not able to find one. And that's where another social factor comes in and, and then they can find this love in the West and be treated well as well. And that's another thing Western men generally, it, it's this stereotypical to, be, to, tr to treat women more equally to themselves. And I think emancipation in the Western society helps. And Russia sort of still has a lot of patriarchatic rules where women are treated you know, in some places more poorly than men are. So that's another issue. I actually found very interesting that Russia was ahead of the United States in that in 1917, women were allowed to vote in Russia versus 1920 in this country. Um, <laughs> you know, that's... I didn't so, know that. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I had to do a little research on Russia. So <laughs> when, I, when I think about Korea, my homeland... Compared to when I left it in 74, it's a different country. It, it's considered, I still think it's a developing country versus developed country, one of the powerhouses, maybe in top 12 or something worldwide. So it is a country that's so different than what I left. But for you, how do you see Russia now compared to when you left 20-some years ago in terms of economic and other cultural development? It's a good question. I, I, I believe Russia changed a lot. Um, in, to some degree, it changed, it changed to become uh, more westernized in a, business, uh, in a business sense. Like, for example, Russia takes example of US and Europe uh, in, in uh, context of uh, professional approach to, to business. I think, I think there's more business culture now in Russia that, that is more similar to one in, in Europe and the US. Uh, yet there are a lot of, uh, I would say, hidden stones and internal way to do business, internal ways to do business that are still very Russian, right? And they're not changing for some reason. So, I mean, things like bribes, for example, right? So, like, I work in Russia. Part of my market is in Russia. So, I, I have customers in Russia. So, when we develop market in Russia, we try to work the same way as we work for the U.S., market but the rules there are different oftentimes we get requests like okay we'd like to do business with you but uh before we buy from you we'd like you to make sure we'd like to make sure that we get something under the table mm. back so like a secretary placing an order on behalf of a business wants some reward for herself to choose yeah. you for example this is called like a rollback thing model where in russia it's completely acceptable and and, and a common practice. And if you're not playing that game, then you're not going to be as successful in Russia as some other companies. So we decided 
that we're not going to play that game. And so we don't get enough business, as much business in Russia as we could have if we were to play that game by their rules. So that's an example. You know, it's sad to say, but Korea, it's the same still. It's, hmm. They're looking for that envelope under the table to make anything happen, you know, even yeah. in 2020. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when... Our mutual friend told me about you. I found your website to be fascinating, and it's it's amazing how you, I mean, you learned the language when you were in your 20s and got your MBA from Babson, which is not a easy task. And here you are. You've you know you, you are at multiple um, sites about your life story, and it's very admirable. And sure. right now. Is there a pathway for Russians to come to the United States other than the path you took? There's many pathways today compared to what we've had before. I believe um, I've seen now a lot of Russian immigrants coming in. Like at my time, most immigrants who came, they were coming as refugees or um, green card uh, lottery winners. Um, so so immigration was either of those lucky few who got the mm. green card uh, through the diversity visa or or the other group were basically is a Baptist who were prosecuted in their country or, or Jews who were again prosecuted. Yeah. So it was kind of a kind of a homogeneous group in a way. Yeah. Today we see people coming in on uh, business visas, for example, who want to who want to open business, investment visas, investors who come in with a couple million dollars on the bank sure. account. They come in and they they start businesses here and they get the visa as a as an entrepreneur looking to start here and hire people. So, I mean, I've seen that. I've seen some people like that who come in. Um, I've seen some a lot, a lot of H-1Bs coming in through either, uh, you know, uh, biotech or high-tech model. Um, a lot of educated people who come in and, you know, and just start working here, eventually turning into green card and then staying. So a lot of professional immigration is still happening. Um, but I would, I would say it's a mix now and there's a lot of ways to come here today. Uh, that that weren't as available in the, in the past. Although I'm not sure what Trump administration has done the last few years. I think we're changing a lot. Um, it was very anti-immigrant policy, and uh, I believe um, I believe this is um, this is this is kind of changing. And uh, another thing is uh, I'm involved with one venture fund that it's uh, it's called One Way One Way. Um, one way ventures. Um, you you probably should, by the way, you should probably interview the founder. Uh, maybe he'll features to you because he's a an immigrant. His name is Simeon Dukac. Maybe mm -hmm. you've heard of him. He's formerly a uh, Russian uh, Jew as well. He came. Uh, he's a very successful uh, venture, venture capitalist today, and he's found he's founded this fund on a, on the premise he only his fund only invests in startups that are founded by immigrants. At hmm. least one founder has to be an immigrant. Interesting. Otherwise. Otherwise, fund will not invest into that startup. Wow, wow! So I think you would be perhaps interested to talk. Yeah, to him that, you know. I'll look. I'll look him up. Hey, uh, will you be voting in a couple of weeks? Yes, I. Uh, I have this <laughs> uh, envelope here. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, you got to vote. You know. Yeah. Tell us. Tell us something in Russian to our listeners. Something positive. Advice. From your life story in Russian language, of course. <laughs> sure. Uh, so uh, uh, I would say, "Period и вверх." Period и вверх means ahead and up. <laughs> <laughs> Or hey. in one word in English, onward. <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, I have one last question for you. Did you ever watch the movie Dr. Zhivago? Uh, I think I remember bits of it. I, I, I believe so, but I, I, I don't recall the in detail. I, I forget very quickly. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, with Lawrence, uh, it's um, Omar Sharif story about, it's a love story. And I, re I mentioned that because it's one of the first foreign movies I saw as a child in 1960s. Oh. And oh. I got to see a few more times as, as an adult. And each time I see it, I have a different takeaway. But it's the Russian movie, which I think is the best ever. So I thought I wanted to ask you if you ever saw it. 
Is that black and white? The one I saw was colored. So, oh. yeah. Yeah, I think there are a couple of remakes, but uh, yeah, I should, I should really watch it. Thank you. You should watch it. Dimitri, thank you so much. And if I have an occasion sure. to order some gift baskets, I'm going to go through you. Please. Uh, the my trail, you have a you have a permanent discount whenever you need it. Just <laughs> ping me. <laughs> have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Bye bye. You know, I was listening to Dimitri's story. Um, the difference I've heard is his father being educated. He was able to go from um, essentially one country to the other doing the same job, just in from Cyrillic Russian to English. And then there, we have many immigrants like my father who really didn't have the education, so he had to start from the bottom. And that probably is more of common story than the, the educator, educated ones. But whether it's from Russia, Korea, or other countries, it is really fascinating. And Dimitri has done really well. His company is very successful. So if you ever are interested in sending gift baskets, you should look them up and use his online. But any, um, you know, these names I get to interview, I, my friends tell me about Dimitri and others. And it's making its way through the entire alphabet. So just join us each time. This Sunday, however, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I have my friend who's coming on to talk about her birth experience. So she's from New Hampshire, and we'll be talking about her last birth experience. And I thought it was a very important topic, so she'll be joining us this Sunday. Until next time, take care.